In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the Word into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 15, verse 27. Matthew 15, verse 27. We went over this last night, but we'll go over it again as we move on. 1527, she said, that is the, uh, the lady in view here, Truth, Lord, but even the little dogs eat the crumbs. Truth, Lord, meaning that his doctrine is correct, and she recognizes that. Because our Lord had just told her, I did not come for uh, the, the Gentiles, but I came for the people of the house of Israel. And he tells her this as a test to her to see if she will uh, continue to respond with the faith rest, and she does. In fact, she has a lot more doctrine than the disciples do who have been with him for at least a year now and will continue to be with him for approximately three years before he departs. Uh, to be with God the Father. So she says, Truth, Lord, but even the little dogs eat the crumbs. She considers herself a little dog. That's what the Gentiles were re referred to as dogs. It wasn't complimentary. It was a very, uh, well, it, it, it meant uh, that uh, they were nothing, really, except faith alone in Christ alone made her better than a dog. She had perfect righteousness, and she knew this. And she knew it was imputed to her at faith alone in Christ alone. So she knew that she had a right to come to the Lord. So she knew a superseding principle of grace. And she knew that our Lord was teaching doctrine by saying that he came to the house of Israel first. He did go there first, but now he's died as a substitute for everyone. She understood that as well. So she actually comes up with a superseding principle of grace. And that's why we grow in grace and in knowledge. We grow in grace first. Knowledge is second. And we have to have some knowledge of grace first because if all we do is uh, just get doctrine without relating it to grace, we'll try to shove it down everybody's throats. And this is what the disciples wanted to do because they became very self-righteous because they had hung around Jesus for so long. They thought of themselves as great. They thought of the Gentiles as inferior. They had a lot of racial arrogance going on. And so when our Lord said, I've come to the house of Israel, uh, you could imagine the disciples shaking their head, yes, Lord, you did. In other words, we're greater than she is. But she's about to uh, show that she has a greater use of the faith rest drill than these disciples do, the students of our Lord, far greater. And so after she said, truth, Lord, but even the little dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table, then Jesus answered her, woman, your faith is great. Now, he complimented her by saying that her faith was great. How many times has he complimented the disciples thus far? None. He always said, Oh, you of a little faith. Never even said their faith was great, and that's because it wasn't. But this woman, a Gentile woman, had great faith, great use of the faith rest drill. And uh, this should have shocked the, uh, the disciples. And they should have said to themselves, or thought to themselves, well, the Lord has never complimented me in this way. He's always said, oh, you of a little faith. And now this woman comes along, a Gentile woman of all things, and he says, woman, your faith is great. They should have woke up right there, and they should, red flags should have started flying and gone up, and they should have said, Israel's about to fall. I have failed. Israel is failing. And here's a Gentile woman coming from a foreign country expressing more faith than any Israelite has thus far. And what should have happened is that should have sent up warning flags, but it didn't. They were a bit uh, hard-headed at this point. And they weren't even thinking that their country was going under. They were thinking that uh, they were special. 
And as children of Israel, they do have a special title, but of course it's reciprocal, and the Jews must have a reciprocal love for God the Father and must come to know Jesus Christ in the same way Gentiles do. Otherwise, they're no different. And it was regeneration that set the Jews apart. It wasn't their race. It was the fact that Abraham believed in the Lord, and it was credited to his account for righteousness. And then, and then Abraham became a Jew when he reached spiritual maturity. So it has nothing to do with race. And this is what our Lord is trying to bring out here, that race is not an issue that you, Peter, who always, and this is uh, mainly for Peter, because he always thought of himself as racially superior. He always had a tendency toward self-righteousness. And if the Lord hadn't straightened him out, he'd be a Pharisee already. He went with that group, and we noted that earlier because he criticized the Lord and said, uh, why did you talk to them that way? They were offended. Well, so what? They needed to be offended. Now we move on to 1529, and we have our Lord healing many others. And we have here the failure of the disciples again. And in 1529, when he left there, Jesus went along the Sea of Galilee. Then he went up a mountain where he sat down. And he sat down because this is a reflection of his mental attitude. He had a relaxed mental attitude. Our Lord never perseverated about anything. He never uh, let things uh, take hold of him. He never ran them through his mind over and over and over again. He, of course, he knew the plan. He had a personal sense of destiny. He was there to fulfill it. So he did have a mental attitude of relaxation. And uh, now they should be able, now here he is at the Sea of Galilee, and they should be able to look at the Sea of Galilee, and they should remember that they need to be using the faith rest drill. He's hammered it into their heads over and over and over again. And he's uh, shown the disciples that he can calm the sea. He's shown the disciples that he can turn uh, five loaves of bread into enough to feed a whole bunch of people and have 12 loaves left over. He's shown that he has, he has the ability to perform miracle after miracle, and there should be no reason for them to have any doubt concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, yet they still do. And this goes to show that miracle is not the thing that uh, we see a miracle and we might be impressed by it. But it's doctrine that really gets us going and has us living the spiritual life. And miracles do occur. Someone might have cancer and uh, they might uh, pray a prayer, as, as people have done before. A woman has found out that she was dying of cancer. She was positive toward the Word of God and she said, and she went in prayer to God the Father and said, Father, heal me because I want to be around to guide my children. That's a perfect prayer, a good one. And so the cancer would suddenly disappear, and God would uh, le let her live so that uh, uh, she could actually uh, 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 fulfill the prayer that she wanted to fulfill to lead her children in the spiritual life. And so there was healing, but that's a miracle, and it does happen today, and uh, that's all dependent on the omniscience of God. But from that we gain no uh, use of the spiritual skills. We do not learn how to use the problem-solving devices when a miracle occurs. If anything, a miracle would be an impediment to the problem-solving devices because every time a problem would come along, we would ask for it to go away, and a miracle would be performed and it would go away and we would have no spiritual growth. We must go through testing. We must go through hard, adverse times. We also must go through prosperity to see if we can handle that, and we'll go through the realm of all of it just to see if we can stick with the spiritual life through all circumstances. And if we could change our circumstances at the uh, snap of our fingers, we'd never grow up spiritually. So these miracles, while important in showing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, they, the, the true power, and we'll note this in a minute, the true power is always in Bible doctrine. The true power is in the two uh, power options, the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, and Operation Z. And then in 1530, Then great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame, blind, crippled, mute, and many others with different handicaps. They threw them at his feet, and he healed him. Uh, your Bibles might say they cast them. Well, they actually, in the Greek, the indication is they threw him at his feet. 
And why did they do that? It wasn't out of any lack of sympathy. There's just such large crowds that uh, our Lord was healing uh, one person after another. So one person would go up and have a uh, paraplegic and just throw them at the Lord's feet. Just throw them. And then, uh, well, they had been carrying these people for miles and miles, and they were pretty wore out. And they knew the Lord was going to heal him or heal them. So it was actually a showing that this crowd had a lot of faith rest. Because they knew they could just take a paraplegic and throw him. Even see how far they could throw the paraplegic. <laughs> and they've probably been wanting to do it since they've been carrying them so long. And they're getting a bit frustrated and irritated and they're sweating. So they just throw them at the Lord. Well, by, by the time they hit the ground, they're healed. So there's no bruises. And, and they know this. And this shows their great faith. They know that they can even throw these people down at the Lord's feet. Nothing's going to happen to them except healing. And that is exactly what occurred. And uh, we might look at it as, well, these people aren't sympathetic. Well, they were. They just knew. They had a faith rest drill and knew that uh, these people wouldn't be harmed no matter what they did by throwing them on the ground or however they presented them to the Lord. They knew they would be healed. And they were. And by the time they hit the ground, they bounced up and were healed and started running around. They were a paraplegic with no use of hands and arms. Well, now they're healed, and now they're running around, excited as ever. Didn't even care that they were thrown at the Lord's feet. And that's the indication. And this shows that these crowds had great positive volition. They knew that the Lord would heal them. If they were timid about it, and they weren't really sure if the Lord would heal them, they would have probably been real gentle and just laid them at the Lord's feet and said, here, heal this person. But there were so many of them, they just, poof, and then healed, and then poof, another person would throw them, and then heal it. And uh, probably uh, some of the people in the back of the line looked at the front and said, hey, this must be the procedure. We must throw them at his feet. (laughs) And so uh, they saw it happen, and then they uh, did it with more zeal. And so they threw them even harder, but it didn't matter. The Lord was going to heal them. And remember, we studied earlier how some of the people limited the Lord. And they said, the only way we can be healed is to touch his garment. Well, they limited the Lord and they limited grace. These people weren't limiting the Lord. They were just casting the people right in front of his feet and they were healed immediately. 1531, as a result, the crowd was astounded when they saw the mute chattering. Now, if you've never talked your whole life and suddenly you can speak, you're going to keep on speaking and you'll chatter about anything. You'll you'll probably talk about how blue the sky is or just anything insignificant and just talk off the top of your head because you can speak for once, (laughs) unlike myself, but you can speak for once. So the crippled became healthy, and so they were dancing around, and the lame started walking, and the blind could see for the first time. You see they're on a mountain, so there's a good view. And the first time ever they can see, and they can look out over the Sea of Galilee on this mountain, and it's beautiful. And then on clear days they can look over to the west and see the Mediterranean Sea, and that's beautiful. And they can see the mountains in the in the horizon in the background, and that's beautiful. So the people who were blind are probably just standing around with their jaws wide open, just looking at all the beautiful things. And then looking at people. They'd always matched uh, faces with voices, and now they can see the face with the voice. And sometimes they were probably a bit shocked and said, that person's a lot uglier than I thought they were going to be. And uh, that's how it worked. And that is the power of all of this that's going on. But we see from all this that the, the disciples get nothing from it. They see this healing going on again, It's like Forrest Gump going to see the president again. Once you see it enough, it gets old. You go meet the president one time, yeah, it's all great and exciting. But once you've gone several times, I'm going to see the president again. And this is how they were thinking. I'm seeing a miracle again. They were pretty bored by all of it. And it really had no impact on them because they had no doctrine. If they had had the word of God, the impact would have been great. And then in 1532, then Jesus called the disciples and said, he's about to test the disciples again, I have compassion on the crowd because they have already been here with me three days and have nothing to eat. So they've been there for three days and they have absolutely 
nothing to eat. And then he goes on, I do not want to send them away hungry, since they may faint from exhaustion on the way. Now he did not, a principle to get from this is he did not want to send them away fasting. He didn't want them to go away fasting. Uh, he wanted them to uh, uh, receive food. And all the religious crowd had always said, I fast, I'm great. Well, here we see here, the Lord doesn't want anybody to fast. He wants their bellies to be filled, especially after three days they've been running up mountains, the blind can see, the lame can walk. And, after, and you can see that they were really healed because they ran around for three days straight, probably didn't even get a wink of sleep. And now the Lord looks out and he looks at them and he sees that they're about to get tired and some of them are about to faint. They don't want to go to sleep. They've just been healed. Who would want to go to sleep after they haven't been able to talk or walk for so long? Uh, nobody. They'd want to uh, walk, use their legs as much as they could, and they wore themselves out, and they didn't want to go to sleep because uh, maybe they'll wake up and they won't be there anymore. You know how people think, and they want to get most use of it out of it as they could. And so they got exhausted, and a lot of them are about to faint. Now the disciples said to him, where is enough bread in the desert to feed so great a crowd? These people are dumb. They're idiots. They had just seen our Lord perform miracle after miracle. He had seen the Lord feed these people, another group of people, before. A larger group of people, 5,000. This time it's 4,000 men. Last time it was 5,000. He's already seen what the, the Lord can do in regards to healing and in regards to food. But they get their eyes on the problem again. And we might want to laugh at them and say, ha ha, they're idiots. But just think about yourself. How many times do you get your eyes on the problem when your eye needs to be on the solution? We're all the same. We're just like the disciples. And, and sometimes we could look at them and laugh at them and judge them. But uh, guess what? Every time a problem comes along and we don't have a solution for it, we're being stupid. Don't we know that the Lord himself can provide enough bread for anyone at any point? And uh, if any point you get to a point in your life where you're worried about logistical grace support and you look at your checking account and you say, In, well, I'm not going to make ends meet, and then you worry about it and think about it and perseverate about it, you're being just like the disciples. Don't you know the Lord's going to provide? That is, of course, you have to have common sense too. doesn't mean you can't go out and uh, just blow all your money and say the Lord will provide. He'll provide for you bankruptcy in that case. But uh, what this means is uh, you do what you need to do as far as working is unto the Lord and having common sense, and, and God will provide. Don't worry about it and don't perseverate. But th these disciples were worried. They were hungry again. And obviously, uh, Peter especially must have been a large man who liked a lot of food because the only thing that's brought up, and it's probably Peter speaking here because we note in Scripture after Scripture, it's always Peter who chimes in and has to say something. And so Peter's probably hungry again, and he wants to fill his bed belly. So he says, where's enough bread in the desert to, so to feed so great a crowd? And then in 1534, Jesus said to them, how much bread do you have? They replied, seven loaves and a few, notice this, I don't know if it's in your translation, and a few little fish, as if that matters. Well, if they had a few big fish, could they feed the 4,000? No. So uh, they're trying to make a, an issue out of the problem. Not only do we only have a few fish, but they're just little. There are probably a few brim there. About this big. This is all we got. Big deal. Didn't you see our Lord turn a few fish into a lot before? No, they've forgotten all of that. The principle out of this is your rate of learning must exceed your rate of forgetting. And these disciples forget as soon as they see it. These disciples are like a lot of us. And uh, you could learn the faith rest drill and I could stand up here and teach the faith rest drill. You know what this means? I know exactly what it means. It means I could stand up here and teach to you the faith rest drill for three years straight, and some of you still would never get it. That's what it means. And it takes time, of course. Uh, but if the disciples didn't get it, being with the Lord, a perfect Bible teacher, someone who was eloquent, 
someone who could uh, preach eloquently and really make the issue known, someone in perfection, the God-man, if he couldn't uh, tell these people within three years what the faith rest drill was all about, well, I got a job cut out for me as well. And it, it takes a lot, a lot of time for people to get with it. And uh, I've known people that, that have heard that uh, uh, in eternal security, they've heard all the verses about eternal security over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, and they still don't believe it. Well, it's time to start believing some of these things. It's time to start believing that once you're saved, you're always saved. It's time to start believing that when God gives us a promise, He sticks to His promises. And when God says we have eternal life, it's time to believe we have eternal life, meaning forever and ever. And there's and to think that we can lose it, if you think that, and I don't know if anyone here does, I'm just, uh, just saying that if you think that, you're so far from the spiritual life right now that you're as stupid, if not stupider, than these disciples. That is a most basic basic of doctrines. And until you grab onto that and understand it, the things that I'm teaching now are right over your head. And you'll never get it. You'll be like the disciples listening for three years and still never get it. Uh, but it does take time, and this is actually a source of encouragement to see the disciples' stupidity. It, it should remind us of ourselves. It should remind us, It should remind us of the fact that sometimes we just don't get it. And even though we hear it day after day after day, we still don't get it. These disciples were no different. And as Jesus said to them in 1534, How much bread do you have? And they replied, Seven loaves and a few little fish. Then in 1535, after instructing the crowd to sit down on the ground, our Lord goes ahead and instructs the crowd to sit down on the ground. Why? Because he's about to provide something for them. And when it gets to faith rest, the analogy is sit down, wait, don't perseverate, do not worry. All you have to do is sit down and wait for the Lord. So he tells the crowd, sit down. They're about to be fed, all they've got to do is wait for it. So after instructing the crowd to sit down on the ground, he took the seven loaves of fish, and after giving thanks, he broke them and began distributing them to the disciples. Once again, he's going to turn the uh, loaves into bigger loaves, and he's going to turn the disciples into waiters. Last thing they want to be is uh, hustling around uh, trying to wait on 4,000 people. If you've ever been to a restaurant and uh, the crowd is bigger than 500, usually it takes a long time for you to get waited on. Well, this is a 4,000 large crowd, and even though the food's coming out quickly, that's a lot of hustling to give uh, 4,000 people food. So there they are working, and why? Well, it's uh, showing them they shouldn't be worried. They've been working all along. Well, the Lord's saying, all right, keep on working. Now distribute the bread and think about it. And that's exactly what they did. And they distributed this bread. Then they all ate, including the disciples. And then they ended up picking up seven baskets full of pieces left over. Remember the last time with the 5,000, it was 12. One basket for each disciple. Now there's seven. One basket for each loaf of bread. Now, I don't know if it has much significant meaning, but it's just sowing that uh, there were only seven loaves, and now there's seven baskets left over. So our Lord can multiply and uh, even give enough for people to where they'll have some left over. Now, Dallas, if you would grab those papers on that chair back there. I left them back there, and I'll need them in a minute. And so we have... Uh, 1538, they were all satisfied. We got some notes out of that earlier from the 5,000. Not counting the children and women, there were 4,000 men who ate, which means there were approximately uh, nine to 10,000 people there. And after sending away the crowd, he got into the boat and went into the region of Magdala. So after all of this, he went into the region of Magdala. Now we're going to get to the uh, point of the unholy alliance. There's going to be an unholy alliance between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees and the Sadducees are two different political parties. The Pharisees is a political party that is very religious, 
and the Pharisees do believe in the resurrection. The Pharisees believe in the angels. The Sadducees do not. The Sadducees are rational. And if they can't see it, they say it doesn't exist. So they don't believe in the resurrection, neither do they believe in angels. Both are religious, however, and the, Sa the Sadducees like to follow a lot of tradition. The Pharisees follow both tradition and religion. So then in 1533, is that progressing logically or did I skip? 1533, then the disciples said to him, where is enough bread in the desert to feed so great a crowd? Now these disciples uh, are going to be with the Lord for three more years, and so that's not progressing just right. Let me get it straight. 15, 30, 31, 32. I'm on 16.1. If you're not organized in life, you're a failure. So, the unholy alliance demands a sign. Now, it says in 16.1, Now, when the Pharisees and Sadducees... Now, the Sanhedrin was made up of four religious groups with different criteria. That's the Sanhedrin, the political group of the time. And two of these made up the Nationalist Party, and the Nationalist Party included the, the uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees were the religious zealots who believed in the supernatural. They used legalism, and they believed in the resurrection and angels, which of course exist. The Sadducees, however, were aristocrats in the land, and they always used rationalism, and they did not believe in anything that they could not see. And that's like atheists today. So while opposed to each other, they're all willing at this point to bury their differences in order to come in one accord against our Lord Jesus Christ. They wanted to destroy our Lord, both of them. So they put aside their differences because doctrine is being taught. And uh, people who don't want doctrine don't like it. They don't want to hear it. And so they want to destroy it. So they form an unholy alliance. And we're going to see confusion of religion here because they're not on one accord. They're both religious. Both the Sadducees and Pharisees are very religious, but there's confusion related to it. And you might not understand it uh, as it was back then, but as it is today, uh, there are some people who make a big issue out of baptism. And uh, there's been people to walk up to my house and say, do you believe in the uh, pouring on of water from the sprinkling of water like the Catholics do, or in immersion? Well, that's, not a, that's a non-issue. But religious people make it an issue, and then they pick at each other about it. And this is what the Sadducees and Pharisees did. They picked at each other. But once they saw a man teaching grace, they're not going to pick at each other. They're both going to focus their guns and their barrels right at the Lord. They'll put their differences aside for a moment just to destroy grace. That's what religion does. And you might find religious people who disagree on all sorts of things, but if they know you are a believer who believes in grace, and you're a believer growing in grace and in knowledge, they'll both attack you, even though they come from complete, a complete different set of backgrounds. So now when the Pharisees and Sadducees came to test Jesus, they were hoping to find a flaw, of course, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. And uh, this is what occurs. Uh, when when uh, Sometimes people are coerced to come to class, and what occurs is they uh, sit down, and instead of listening, because they've been coerced, I understand it, they want to pick at everything that's said just as they are with the Lord. And some of these people are there. Some of them have been coerced to be there. Some of them are there to just trip up our Lord. And when that occurs, they, they're going to be very attentive to the message, not to believe what is being said, but to question what is being said, to destroy what is being said. And some people walk into a church service with one intention only, to destroy what is being said. And then when they walk out after being coerced, they say, See, I told you, this man said blah, 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 I didn't want to be here, and that's all wrong, and I'm offended, etc., etc. Well, that's what they were doing. And the same thing occurs today in all doctrinal churches, all places that teach grace. 
Even if they teach just a little grace, there's going to be a tax. So what they're saying is they want to see a miraculous deed from heaven. Well, how, how, uh, how stupid are they? They've been seeing miraculous deeds ever since the Lord started His ministry. They've heard about them. They've seen them. And when they saw them, they said, This man is of the devil. And if they were to see him again, guess what they would say? This man is of the devil. And he could have turned the sky bronze red, or he could have turned the sky blue, purple, pink, whatever color he wanted to turn the sky, and they would say, this man is the devil. There was no miracle that was going to impress them. Our Lord knew this. And this is really strange, because they had seen so many miracles, and now they come up to the Lord, just show us another miracle. We'll believe then. No, you won't. Don't, it doesn't matter how many miracles you see, you're not going to believe. And our Lord knows this, so this is what our Lord says in 16.2. He said, When evening comes, you always say, Fair weather, for the sky is fiery red. That's what it says in the Greek. Your translation might say red, but it's really a fiery red from the Greek. When evening comes, you always say, Fair weather, for the sky is fiery red. And I say fair weather because our Lord was being elliptical. And when people are elliptical in the Greek language, it means they're being forceful. Our Lord was shouting. And you might not think this is a point at which to shout at, but he's going to really make a point here. When evening comes, you always say, fair weather, for the sky is fiery red. Now, even though these people were educated in the Mosaic Law, they were also the weathermen of the day. They were considered wise in the Mosaic Law. So they just thought they were wise in everything. And they were the weathermen as well. And uh, to say that uh, it's going to be fair weather when the sky is fiery red, that's, that's a pretty good indication that there will be clear weather. And we even have that saying today, red at night, sailors to light. And it's true if the storms are moving from west to east, and usually they do. But this summer, storms have been moving all different directions. We've had storms come from the northeast, the east, and if at, the, if at nighttime it's bloody red, it's because that the sun is reflecting off of clouds in the east. But if the clouds are moving westward, it's going to rain. But they always assumed that the clouds were moving eastward. And most of the time they do in the northern hemisphere. But sometimes they don't. There are exceptions. So it was a good way to predict weather. Not entirely accurate, but a pretty good way. So what they wanted was a sign from heaven. So what does Jesus do? He turns their attention toward heaven, toward the sky. And he says, all right, do you want a sign from heaven? Here's a sign when the sky is fiery red. It's going to be clear weather tomorrow. That's what you say, even though it's not always right. But uh, what he's trying to tell them is, you look to the sky, but you can't even look into the Word of God and see that I'm the Messiah. You can't look into the Word of God and see that I will be the one who will perform certain miracles that have all been listed. I am the one that will be born this way. I am the one that will live this way. I am the one that will die this way. All listed in the Old Testament. They could look at the sky. In other words, they were more interested in being weathermen than people who were interested in the Word of God. That's the point. And that's what our Lord is saying. So when evening comes, you always say fair weather, for the sky is fiery red. Then in 16.3, And in the morning, you say stormy weather, because the sky is fiery red and cloudy. You know how to examine the appearance of the sky, but you cannot evaluate the signs of the times. In other words, you're so interested in weather, yet you don't even know the signs of the times. You can't even look back in Scripture. and In other words, the Word of God's never been number one to you. Even though you've memorized it, it doesn't mean a thing. And when you meet people who memorize a lot of Scripture, as they do in a lot of churches today, and you join, and they make you memorize this and this and that, and then you all get in competition with each other and say, I memorized this and you didn't memorize that, it's meaningless! If you don't know what it means, it's meaningless! And they had memorized the whole Old Testament, and it was meaningless. And I don't care who you are. You can memorize the whole Old Testament and the whole New Testament. And if you're not filled with God the Holy Spirit, and if you're not growing in grace and in knowledge, it's meaningless. You need a Bible teacher to teach you what these things mean. 
Now, if you say, I'm smart enough, I can just read it on my own and get it. Let me tell you something. You're so full of yourself and so full of arrogance, you, you don't even have a clue. You're just going to get confused. Why does God the Father give the gift of pastor-teacher? You know, there would be no use for pastors. Why go to church? Why does anyone go to church if they could read it on their own? Why doesn't everybody sit on their butts at home and learn as much of the Word of God as they can on their own? Because there is a such thing as a pastor-teacher. And it's the same concept. And, and if you say you can do it on your own, what you're saying is, I can be a doctor on my own. You go to a doctor, why? Because he specializes in a field, a field of medicine. And you go to a mechanic because he specializes with cars. And you go to a whole bunch of other people because they specialize in a certain field. And you do not say to yourself, I can get it all on my own. Well, if that were the case, be your own doctor, and some people try to be, and then end up very ill. And they end up putting cabbage on their leg when they need to go to a doctor. And it's just plain arrogance. Or they end up reading some weird book on nature and how nature is going to solve this and that and, and, and taking herbs and spices and all that, things that the Chinese do. And the Chinese have a, a lot smaller uh, lifespan than we do. These doctors specialize in a field, and if you say, I know more than them, you're arrogant. And if you say you know more than a pastor teacher, well, you may. And if you do, they shouldn't be your pastor teacher. You should move on. If you ever think you come under a pastor teacher and you say to yourself, I know more than this joker, get out of the church. You're going to go backwards then. But don't stand around and brag about it. Same way, if you think you know more than a doctor, you're going to leave that doctor and go to one who knows a bit more. I got off on something for some reason. But in 16.3, and in the morning, stormy weather because the sky is fiery red and cloudy. You know how to examine the appearance of the sky, but you cannot evaluate the signs of the times. Now in the morning what happens, and this is true, sun rays reflect off of the thick clouds that are to the east. And usually that means the storm has gone on, it's passed, because usually storms in the northern hemisphere pass from west to east. So the sun, well, I got it backwards here, when the sun comes up, uh, they they say stormy weather. I did this backwards. And in the morning, stormy weather because the sky is fiery red and cloudy. That means that to the west, there's clouds, thick clouds on the horizon. And when the sun hits the clouds, it reflects and causes a red hue in the sky. And so that means rain is on the way. Or snow or whatever. Anything related to clouds is on the way. And that's because it moves from west to east. But if you have a nor'easter, uh, for example, and a lot of snowstorms in the northeast move from the southwest, and they move up, and then the, all the precipitation is blown in off the ocean from the east. And it might have been snowing all the day, the, yesterday, and then that morning you wake up and it's red. Now these Pharisees would look up and see a red sky and say, Oh no, it's going to snow some more. But not really, it's moving away. It's moving out of the picture. And uh, so it was a, a pretty accurate way to do it, but not 100% foolproof. But the Word of God is, and this is the point from Jesus Christ. He's saying you look to the sky. Sometimes you get it right, sometimes you get it wrong. But you don't look to the infallible Scriptures. In other words, you didn't look at the signs of the Messiah that are found in Ezekiel. You didn't bother to look in Ezekiel and say, my goodness, this is the Messiah. You didn't bother to look in Isaiah and say, my goodness, this is the Messiah. They didn't bother to look in Jeremiah or Hosea or in Zechariah. All of this has been listed in the Old Testament. Instead, they're busy staring at the clouds. Their priorities are all wrong, and they're wrong because they don't have a spiritual life. They're not even saved. And then in 16.4, our Lord's really going to bring it home and He's going to slam these people hard. He's going to do it in a way in which they're going to be slammed, in which they're going to be insulted. Even though what He's saying really isn't that insulting. But He's going to use words that are insulting. But what He's saying is just truth. But He's going to frame truth in a way in which it's going to insult people. 
So our Lord would never be the author of a book called How to Win Friends and Influence People. And there's a lot of books like out like that out today in which uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People, just be smile, just smile a lot, be nice. Uh, be able to understand what their likes and dislikes are and hold a conversation, all of which is fine for human social life, but our Lord was on a mission. And he wasn't there to make friends with the Pharisees. In fact, uh, he could care less if they, well, he did want them to follow him, he did want them to believe in him, but we'll see all that's involved in this. He's going to bring down, he's going to bring it down to brass tacks, he's not going to pull any punches, He's going to say, this is the way it is, accepted or rejected. So in 16.4, and unbelieving, that's what wicked means. Wicked means unbelieving. But our Lord uses the word wicked in order to shock them. To them, this is a shock. They always think they're so great. They think they're greater than the Lord Jesus Christ. So he looks at them and says, a wicked really means an unbelieving. And unbelieving and religious, that's where adulterous comes in. They're not really adulterous, they may be, but this isn't dealing with adultery as per the sexual relationship of a man and woman outside the confounds of marriage. This is adulterous as in they've committed spiritual adultery through religion. The Jews were to have faith alone in Christ alone and use the faith rest drill. That was their whole uh, system from the beginning when the Jews were there. That's why Abraham believed in the Lord and it was credited to his account for righteousness. That's why when he went to spiritual maturity, he circumcised himself, all of which was a reflection of spiritual growth, faith alone and then spiritual growth. But they've committed spiritual adultery. And the same thing is said about the Israelites in Jeremiah before they go under the fifth cycle. And if the disciples had any doctrine, they could have thought to themselves, Oh no, I'm being called, or the Jews are being called adulterous. Yet Jeremiah called us the same thing. Times must be getting pretty rough, and they were. And so they called him... Uh, but you have to understand, these are Pharisees, and he uses words that they can understand and identify with. Because they always walk around, ooh, that person's wicked. They don't wash their hands before they eat. That person is terribly wicked. So our Lord turns right around and says, a wicked and adulterous. You see, adultery was one of the worst sins in their minds just as it is in a lot of believers' minds today. But it's not the worst sin. It's definitely a terrible sin, but not the worst sin. And so he just describes them as being the worst low-down people on the face of the earth. He says, you are wicked. You are adulterous. So an unbelieving religious generation asks for a sign, but no sign will be giving it except the sign of Jonah. Your Bibles might say Jonas. That's the Greek word. In the Hebrew, it ends with an H. It's dealing with Jonah. And what it's saying here is that Bible doctrine is far superior to any miracles. You want a miracle? You're not going to get a miracle. I'm going to give you some doctrine. And on top of giving you doctrine, I'm going to insult you so that you have a very clear choice. Either you're going to say, I'm wrong and I believe, or I'm right and, uh, as it were, uh, well, I'm right and you're wrong, etc., and move on. And that's what the religious crowd did. But he had to make it very clear. Now what happens next is that Jesus left them and departed. And that's what we see from the next verse. Jesus left them and departed. Now why is this given twice? Jesus left them. Yes, he did. And departed. Isn't that redundant? If you were to write that in an English paper and you said, I left the party and departed, you know what your English teacher would do? Make little red marks and say, uh, this is redundant. You said you left, you left. Why are you saying you left and departed? It's two of the same thing. But uh, what we see here is it actually is a correct translation. They left and departed. Or Jesus left and departed. Now in the, in the Greek there are two different words. One deals with leaving mentally, and the other deals with leaving physically. Jesus left them both physically and mentally, and that's the point. Jesus left them and departed, both physically and mentally, meaning he didn't even think about them. He just left and cast them out of his brain. 
In other words, he didn't walk away huffing. He didn't walk away saying, those SOBs don't believe in me, <clears throat> and just thinking about it. No, that would be sin. That would be perseverating on things that he wouldn't need to think about. Instead, he said, I've given it to them. In other words, his conscience is clean. He's given them the scripture, the gospel, and they can either accept it or reject it, and he's left it into actually their hands. He said, you either accept it or reject it. I'm not even going to think about you anymore. I'm leaving you. And he knows they're going to reject it. And this has a way of application for us because uh, one, sometime in our life we're going to come across somebody whom we love very much and we're going to want them to believe in Christ. But once you give them the message, no matter how much you beg, no matter how much you weep, no matter how much you cry, no matter how much you use public relations, if they've made the choice, you should just uh, leave them alone and depart. Leave them alone mentally. Now, if they're in your family, you don't have to depart physically, but you definitely have to depart mentally. And all of us have had, or most of us have had, someone in our family or some close friends who have never believed in Christ, no matter how many times you tell them about Christ. And the more you tell them, the more they get irritated, and the more they don't want to hear it, and the more you weep. But what our Lord says is, nah, they've, they've made their choice just to depart from them mentally. You don't have to depart physically, but our Lord is going to depart physically because he's going to have nothing to do with this religious crowd anymore. So one is a physical departure. One is a mental attitude departure. And when people are religious and legalistic, guess what? It does not give you a right to be upset. Uh, because uh, who can upset the Word of God? If what you've given them is the Word of God, why are you upset? You've given them the Word of God. If you act upset after you give them the Word of God, why are you being upset over the Word of God that you gave? That is really the principle that comes down. Just walk away or depart from them mentally. And if they're part of your family, of course, have relations with them, but depart from them mentally. And some of them may never want to have relations with you and count that a blessing. Some will count it a test and relax, just as our Lord relaxes. So when you give the gospel, make it clear, and if they reject it, move on. Don't bring it up. The, actually, the, uh, the actual uh, procedure, protocol for it, is to give the gospel twice. Give it to them once. If they reject it, and then the subject comes up again, let them bring the subject up, not you. And they will. And then if they reject it a second time, just forget it. And then if they bring it up a third time, just say, I already told you about all this. It's up to you to believe it or reject it, and just leave it alone. And that's the way you do. And that is actually how our Lord functions. So don't hang around. Uh, it's like uh, if you were to hang around these people and still try to teach them the gospel, or if you are stupid enough to try to teach them the doctrines when they've rejected it, it's just as if you've jumped into a wasp's nest and instead of running away, you're still uh, swiping at them. And you're still agitating the nest. Don't do it. Leave it alone. And uh, they'll stop stinging you. Or they might try to sting you, but uh, you don't care. So it's like you put on a uh, wasp repellent. And what's your wasp repellent? Your mental attitude. That's what it's up to. It's up to you just to say, forget you in your mental attitude and still love them with impersonal love, but uh, it's over. They've made their decision, and as sad as it is, you move on. So now we move to the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees, and I almost laugh when I go get to these verses. <laughs> when the disciples went to the other side, this is the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, they forgot to take bread. They have just been reminded about bread for twice. And they've been having to act as waiters, giving out bread to 5,000 people, which was about 10,000 with women and children, and then about eight or 9,000, which was 4,000 with women and children. And they've been handing out bread for uh, most of their spiritual or the, most of their Christian life. What have they been doing? What, have, what has been their hardest work? Ha being waiters and handing out bread. But what do they do? They forget bread. 
Man. But hey, they're no different than us. When we forget a promise, when we forget the promises of God, when a problem comes along, we forgot the Lord's bread. We have forgotten, just like these disciples have forgotten. And when you're at work and someone talks about you and you fly off the handle and go and talk about them, you've forgotten bread. You've forgotten doctrine. You're just like the dumb disciples. Well, it should be a point of encouragement, but it also should be a point of motivation uh, to get you to uh, remember you need to have the Word of God at all times in all situations. And when you're at school and some young lady talks about you because of your mode of dress and she calls you a slut because you dress simply, which is your choice, and if your parents allow it, that's fine. And then in, instead of being mad all day and seeking revenge... Instead of seeking to destroy that other person's character, well, you've forgotten your bread. What's your bread? Leave it in the Lord's hands. Well, the disciples forgot again. And they forgot how to use doctrine. Well, how many of us have forgotten to use doctrine? All of us, me included. We're, we're all human. And then in 16.6, our Lord explains it. And our Lord shows grace in this instead of just giving up with them. You see, our Lord doesn't give up with them because He knows they're positive. They're willing to listen. And you know how our Lord knows that? Because our Lord has insulted the disciples more than He's insulted anybody. And no matter how much He insults them or insults them, they stick right with Him. No matter how many times He says, Oh, you of little faith. No matter how many times He's looked at Peter and said, You knucklehead. They stick with him. Why? Because they know they're getting something good. They're getting the Word of God. They're getting doctrine. And they don't mind the, the uh, actual personal insults. They don't mind them at all. They know they're learning something. And this is what our Lord uh, does uh, for them. And so he knows they're positive, so he keeps teaching them. Now, if they'd been like the Pharisees, guess what? Peter would have got the first insult and said, Forget this. Nobody talks to me that way. And he'd have walked off and went back home and went back to fishing. And our Lord would have let him. But instead, uh, our Lord chews them out all the time and they stick around. Why? Because they know they're getting something great. So he says, watch out. Watch out, Jesus said to them. Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. The yeast is, of course, false doctrine. It's false doctrine based on a false criteria, uh, but to just know it as false doctrine. The Pharisees and Sadducees give nothing but false doctrine. Now, when we have the word leaven, which is yeast, there are five different categories of leaven. First of all, the leaven of the, of the Pharisees. The leaven of the Pharisees is religious legalism or traditional legalism. We saw traditional legalism in that they were all upset because the disciples didn't wash their hands. Nothing to do with the Mosaic Law. It was just part of tradition, a good tradition. Wash your hands before you eat. Same thing you tell your children when they're growing up and they've been making mud pies and they come in and they're hungry. You say, wash your hands before you eat. A good principle, but not part of Scripture. But they made it part of Scripture, so it's traditional legalism. And guess who followed? Who, guess who had a tendency? He didn't necessarily follow them, but he had a tendency toward the leaven of the Pharisees. Guess who had that? Peter. Peter always had a trend toward legalism, the legalism of the Pharisees. We'll see that much later in the Acts when he argues about the fact that all food is uh, available to eat. And he wants to limit what people can eat. Don't eat pork, don't eat this, don't eat that. And the Lord says, uh, no, you can eat anything. Then he starts to argue. Uh, it's just like Peter to do that. But he has a tendency to be like the Pharisees. And he always pays attention to the Pharisees. We can see he has this tendency because every time the Pharisees criticize him and the Lord, he goes back to the Lord and says, Do you know these people aren't liking this message at all? If you keep talking like that, you're gonna, you'll are gonna, you never win these people. Of course not. They would never be won anyway. Uh, but uh, that's the way Peter was. So even people with a trend toward legalism can make it. That's the principle. Then we have the leaven of the Sadducees. And the Sadducees, remember, were into rationalism. If they didn't see it, it wasn't true. If they couldn't see angels, angels didn't exist. 
If they couldn't see a resurrection, the resurrection never occurred. And guess who uh, followed in the leaven of the Sadducees? Do you remember somebody who was doubting in Scripture? Doubting Thomas. Thomas had a, a, a tendency to be like the Sadducees. Religious rationalism. If he didn't see it, it wasn't true. And they came back and said, uh, The Lord Jesus Christ has been resurrected, and he's come back, and he's talking to uh, certain of us now, Mary Magdalene and spe uh, specifically, and he said, I don't believe that. I don't believe that till I see it. Well, he's just like the Sadducees. got to see it before he believes it. Then we have, at point three, the leaven of Herod. Now, the leaven of Herod is being a, uh, is being expedient, a political expediency. The exploitation of others for one's own benefit. Now, Herod was a user for sure, and he was a genius in politics and um, expediency. A genius at being expedient, and that usually makes you a good politician. doesn't make you a good statesman, but makes you a good politician. And we've had recent presidents who were very good at being expedient. And uh, not the most recent, but recent at being very expedient. Well, it's a talent, and it's also leaven. And so we could call the leaven of Herod the leaven of politicians. If you're going to be a politician, I'm not talking about a statesman, there's a difference. But if you're going to be a politician, you better learn how to be expedient. It's not right, it's leaven, it's wrong. Now, the one president I know of who... Uh, didn't follow this principle was Ronald Reagan. He didn't care what people thought. He he had a set of principles. He said, well, what I'm going to do when I'm president is I'm going to build up the military. I'm going to cut taxes from the obscene 90% for the rich to the 28. And he did cut taxes on rich. And when you go to school, they'll say, Ronald Reagan never did nothing but cut taxes on the rich. But remember, the rich give you jobs. You've never been employed by a poor person. So he did cut taxes on the rich and everyone else. And trickle-down economics did work. And you'll go to school, as I did, and they always badmouth Ronald Reagan. Well, it's because he wasn't in the cosmic system. He knew something of establishment. And they'll rip him apart. And they'll say, under Ronald Reagan, deficits shot through the roof. Yes, they did, but who has control of the purse strings? Not the President, the Congress. And who controlled Congress and the Senate? throughout his reign, except that the Senate was under Republican rule for about two years, but most of the time it was always Democrat rule. Democrats did, and they spent, and they, they spent money like uh, drunken sailors, and they're doing the same today. Even Republicans are today. But back then, Democrats were spending like crazy. But the only reason they could is because the economy was going like crazy, too. And... and when you get into that, actually what you're getting into, when uh, teachers teach these things, you're actually getting into a uh, part of the satanic conflict. And you might not recognize it now, with, but with more doctrine you'll be able to recognize it. And Because capitalism, remember, is God's system, not socialism. And everybody else wants socialism. And so uh, Reagan was an expedient. He set down some rules. I'll cut taxes. I'll build the military. I'll do this, this, and this. Deregulate. He did all of it. Every bit of it. He did what he was going to say. He did what he said he was going to do. That's not expedience. And the people who were looking for expedience were dissatisfied. And they said, well, I can't believe this man did actually what he said he was going to do. No president does what he said he's going to do. No president ever goes and does what he says he's going to do. He has to lie about it. He has to be expedient. They didn't understand it. And that's the leaven of the politicians, the leaven of Herod. Then we have the leaven of the Corinthians. That's antinomianism. And I hope you remember what antinomianism is all about. It's licentiousness. It's uh, going out and raising hell. It's uh, being sexually immoral. And we note from 1 Corinthians 5, the man who had sex with his own mother and bragged about it. Well, this is antinomianism. That's the leaven of the Corinthians. Then we have the leaven of the Galatians. They were legalistic. And, uh, of course, we saw the legalism of the, the Pharisees, but uh, we also have the leaven of the Galatians. What happened with the Galatians was they learned that it was faith alone and Christ alone. Then when the Apostle Paul left them, 
of the Jews, or not the Jews, but the uh, Pharisees and all the religious crowd followed right behind him and came into the Galatians and said, Hey, you have to be circumcised to be saved. You must follow the Mosaic law to be saved, plus believe. They always said plus believe, but remember, you add anything to faith, it cancels it out. So this is legalism, the leaven of the Galatians. So leaven always refers to a false criteria. There's a false criteria to leaven. You must do this, you must do that to be saved. Therefore, it produces a false doctrine. Now, the people who give these false doctrines, for the most part, probably 95% of the time, the people who give false doctrine believe it. They're very sincere. And they'll get up and say, you believe in eternal security. You've accepted the doctrines of demons. They believe that. They really do. And they're very sincere in telling you that. But uh, that is the false doctrine that is being produced. But it started off with a false criteria. It, it, it didn't work like, uh, it didn't start out as if they knew the doctrine and then said, uh, well, this is doctrine, but I'm going to intentionally be false. No, it was a process. Their criteria got messed up, so they eventually produced false doctrine. And there are sincere people with false doctrines, but sincerity doesn't mean a thing. There are sincere people who are burning in hell today, and sincerity is meaningless, and a lot of people like to put a lot of uh, clout into sincerity. And especially, young ladies, as responders, you're responders, so you do it. You see a man, and you say, he seems so sincere. It's meaningless. They have to have something behind it. Now, you can be sincere with doctrine. That's wonderful. But you can be sincere with false doctrine. And you can say, this man said he loved me, and he's so sincere. A lot of people know how to act sincere. And you have to be careful of these things, just as you must be careful of the leaven of the Pharisees. You must be careful of the yeast. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to study this portion of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things, and may we grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Christ's name we ask this. Amen.